start now, since the, just in case a couple of stragglers come in, but I'm Charlie. Thank you ever so much for you lot all for coming. This is awesome. I really, really hope what I'm going to talk to you today about is going to be really helpful. I'm going to be chucking a lot of information at you because there's not much time and I apologize if it's a bit much, but feel free to catch me afterwards, ask me any questions and chat about anything you want, okay? So, like I said, I am Charlie. There we go. I'm Charlie, I am a full-time freelance illustrator based here in Norwich and I graduated from Norwich University of the Arts with my illustration degree about five years ago. Any other illustrators in here or aspiring illustrators in here? Hands up. Yes, amazing. I see you shoving a hand up back there. That's awesome. Anyone else just thinking creative careers, something freelance, something like that, game development? Yeah? Wicked. Okay, so this, what I'm going to talk to you about today is going to be useful across the board, not just illustration. It's not specific to illustration, but it's more general creative freelancing. So anything you want to do and pitch yourself, this is going to be really, really helpful for you. So this is one I get an awful lot. I do talks and workshops in schools and colleges a lot, and I'll get asked by parents, isn't illustration just cartoons? Aren't you just drawing cartoons? It's not. There's a whole bunch of stuff that falls under this umbrella of illustration. There can be picture books, which is where I'm primarily based, comics, fashion illustration, editorial illustration, concept art and storyboards for game development, film, TV. There's a huge, huge amount under this umbrella. And this is also something I get asked or told an awful lot at schools and colleges. Uh, has anyone ever had this been said to them before by anyone? Yeah, it gets said a lot. You can't earn a living. You won't earn any money. What are you doing? Become a doctor, become a lawyer. What are you doing? The industry, the creative industry in this country is worth 92 billion pounds, growing at twice the rate of our economy. There's money in this industry, okay? There's nothing to worry about. You're not going to be a struggling, starving artist. That's not a thing. You're going to be fine if you put in the work, if you listen to what I'm going to say. There's money in this industry. Don't panic. But there's no jobs. I looked on monster.com and there were no illustrator jobs. That's because we're all self-employed. You're not going to find an in-house job for an illustrator, often not even for a concept artist or a storyboard artist. We're all freelance. We all work for ourselves, so people come to us, then we move on to the next thing, okay? So we're creating our own jobs. So this is the sort of work that I do. I'm going to briefly show you my sort of work so you have a context, so you know where I'm coming from. I do an awful lot of work with picture books, kids books, graphic novels, like Open Day over there was a graphic novel for Nottingham University. It was all about physics. It was really awesome. I did a talk with Hot Sauce about it. Issy and the Lead Sithis, that word is a disgrace. That took me so long to learn how to say that and spell it. That was a picture book for Peterborough Museum. So that was all about this prehistoric aquatic animal exhibit they had. And Ashling's Collections was just a fun one that I did for myself, okay? because self-initiated work is just as valuable as client work. Character design is one of my very favorite things to do. I love it. It's why I like picture books. It's why I like comics and graphic novels, because I love designing and creating and creating the narrative for characters. And I also had the pleasure of doing a few of these bad boys. So did anyone go and see these, the dragons and the hares? Yeah. So the dragon was one of the very first big client jobs that I had when I got out of uni. It was awesome. I got to meet loads of artists and I got to meet proper clients. And it was my first big paid job. And that led me on to the Go Go Hairs, of which I did two of, which was super cool. And I got to do the map for them as well. So I illustrated the trail map. If anyone picked up any of those, yeah, I <laughs> see your face like, <gasps> Yeah, so I got to illustrate those. It was really cool seeing all these kids and families walking around with these maps that I had illustrated. Really, really exciting work. But it didn't start there, obviously. There was an awful lot of grey area and mistakes and learning by trial and error in between my finest work when I was a kid to where I am now. Okay, so there's this big, big bit in the middle that's often a mystery to people who are starting out. I know when I was a student, that was a complete mystery. No one told me how to get from doing it for fun 
to doing it for a job. So that's what I'm literally going to try and tell you in black and white the ways to do that today. But I'm going to break it down into four sections because there's a hell of a lot of information, all right? So I'm going to break it down like a timeline. So you will start by prepping your work, getting your portfolio ready, deciding what and how to present your stuff to clients. Then how to get it seen. You're not going to get a job if no one knows you exist. You have to be present and active and visual to everyone. Being prepared, some paperwork stuff. What do you do when someone does approach you? You need to have that ready, that knowledge ready, because you don't want to be flustered and panicking when someone asks you to do a job for them. And if you get a job, what do you do? What is the process? What does the client expect? What do they want you to deliver? What should they deliver? literally the timeline of how to do this sort of work. So I'm going to start off with preparing your work. It can be kind of tricky when you're looking at your portfolio, your hard drive, your sketchbooks, what to put in your final cleaned up lovely website or your physical portfolio. Because there can be tons of stuff that doesn't seem to link together. You've got all this uni work, all this college work, all this personal work. What do you present to people? So you're going to have to research it, OK? That's the first thing you need to do is you need to research the heck out of it, like tons and tons and tons of knowledge, get it into your brain. The first step is going to be researching where you put your work. So what industry do you want to go into? And this can be kind of vague. If you're just starting out, it can be, I want to do something in print. That could cover editorial, advertising, publishing, anything. Or you can be really specific, so I want to do concept art for this type of game and this type of character, okay? But make sure you have some sort of direction. Don't just say, I want to be an artist. Who do you want to start approaching? So your dream clients. Think of a dream client list. So for me, no brow would fall in there. For some of you, maybe Bethesda falls in there. Think about the sorts of people you would love to work for and what they're going to be looking for in your portfolio. And then you've got to be real, real honest with yourself for the last question is why are you presenting your work to these people? Is it because you love to work for them or you feel like you should? Because if you're doing it because you feel like you should, you'll find halfway down the timeline you don't want to do it anymore. That's when work starts to get bad. Okay? So be really, really honest with yourself and pitch to people you really love to work with. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown of what they expect to see in two different types of portfolios, so publishing and game art. So in publishing, I know certain things they look for are character sheets. So in a portfolio, whether it's physical or your website, or if you're sending a sample to an agent, they want to see character sheets. Cover designs, whether that's for a client or whether it's just for fun, it's perfectly OK to take Harry Potter and redesign the cover for fun, right? They even love to see that because it shows you've taken something that's been done a lot and you can put a unique spin on it. End papers, which are the bits of paper that go on the front and back cover, weirdly enough, they love to see them. Scenes with backgrounds, I hate that this is in there because I hate doing backgrounds, but I've had to do it. I've done some backgrounds and they like to see them. And sequential images to show that you understand narrative and movement in your stories. And then with games art, they look for silhouettes, so a strong sense of composition and how your final character or, si or asset or um, environment will stand. So a silhouette is a really good thing to have in your portfolio. Characters, people, animals, creatures, or environments. It's always a good idea to have an idea which one you want to focus on, because an awful lot Games uh, industries and games companies and studios will look for a concept artist for illustration and a separate artist for environment and asset, OK? So try to choose one. It's OK to have a bit of each, but try to have a focus of one or the other. And a good demonstration of strong skills, whether that's anatomy, lighting, colour, texture, good real life skills okay so the anatomy has to be accurate the environment studies have to be accurate and then there's a few things that they really don't want to see and i have seen these in portfolios before real bad photographs of your work okay if you don't have a fancy scanner if you have to take photographs of your traditional work make the pictures good 
clean, no weird shadows, no dark paper, nice photographs. Don't trace, don't do copies of other people's work. Anyone can trace, anyone can copy. They're not looking for that. It's not a demonstration of your skill or creativity. Don't put that in your portfolio. Do it for fun, but don't put it in your website. Too much fan art, and I say too much because a little bit is great. Again, like I said about the Harry Potter thing, it's okay to put your own spin on something that's already been done, but don't overload your portfolio with fan art, okay? And don't put super old work in there, all right? If it's more than five years old, it shouldn't be in your portfolio. Don't put your GCSE stuff in there. Don't put the stuff you did at school in there. Keep it fresh and new and up to date with what you can do now, not what you used to do. And excessive variation. I say excessive, again, because it's fine to show that you're adaptable and that you can do different things. But if your work switches from cute little fuzzy bunny to a horrific horror illustration with one page swipe, that's not great. They want to know that you're specialized and you can deliver something specific. So don't vary it too much. And this is something else I get asked an awful lot about. How many people worry about finding their style? Yeah. <laughs> It can, it can be in the back of your head. You'll look through your portfolio and you'll think, oh God, it's changing every page. Ah. But finding your style is tricky and it has to happen naturally. So these are some of my favorite illustrators in the whole world. Really distinctive, really clear styles. I know it's a Natalie Hall. I know it's a John Clarkson. Uh, this is a good example. Everyone know who this is? Who did this? Picasso, yeah. King of cubism, super duper easy, recognizable immediately. How about this one? It's a trick question, I'm being super mean. It's the exact same guy, okay? 41 years apart. That's how long it took Picasso to find his cubist voice. Even Picasso, cubist to the end, wasn't born with this style. No one is, no one's born able to develop a style immediately. It's not gonna take you 41 years, don't panic. We have the internet, things move faster now. But it does have to develop naturally, all right? You can't force it because the second you try to force a style, you'll start subconsciously mimicking someone else's. So let your own style evolve naturally. So now we have a vague idea of what should go into your portfolio and how you're gonna be presenting it to people. We need to know how to get it out there. Okay, what's the best ways to get people to actually see your work? So we have the key three social media platforms. Super obvious, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. They're the key three players. You need to be on all three of these with business pages. Not personal pages, not pictures of your cat, not pictures of your horoscope. These have to be business pages, all right, where you focus on your industry. And they each have different key things that make them amazing. So Instagram is very image based. Facebook has that huge audience and you can pay to market your work a bit better. Same on Instagram. Uh, Twitter is great for finding communities and talking to people. So you can tweet at an art director at Bethesda and it will be fine. They might even reply to you. That won't happen if you email them. On Twitter, it's super easy to talk to people. This is so important to be present on all three and updated on all three. Don't just post a picture and leave it for a year and think I'm present now, okay? You have to be updated. And your own website as well. So how many of you guys already have your own website? That's not enough hands going up. Oh my God, okay. You guys need your websites, right? So there's the key things that you need to have on your website. You obviously need to have the most important page ever, the portfolio, and that needs to be the home page, Not a page you have to click through to find, not a little welcome page where you click on the button and it welcomes you to the website. Have it on the front page, right? Then the about page, which is brief, but it humanizes you. So they get to know the person that they're gonna be hiring. But like I said, keep it brief. A blog is always good to develop projects. So post about a new project you're working on or a new direction you're looking at. If you want to monetize it all as well, if you want to sell a bit of merch or sell some prints, you can e-commerce your website so you can have a store on there, which is really nice to have it integrated into your portfolio. 
And the second most important page that you're going to have on here is the contact. And that needs to be the right hand side of the nav bar, right at the end, very clear, very concise email address in there, no little contact form, email address, because art directors do not like to use those contact forms to get hold of you. Definitely, you need to have the portfolio and the contact page as the most essential pages on your website. So we're going to do a quick checklist of what needs to go in there. Easy navigation, that nav bar along the top was super clean cut and easy to use. A clean design, so black or white, keep it simple. Don't have cluttered things and gifts of horses flying around everywhere, okay? Keep it really nice and simple. They're looking for your work, not what's on your website. Have your own URL, which is really important. You don't want to have, for example, charlievince.squarespace.com, okay? You're going to have to pay for your website. It's just the reality of it, but you want your own URL, so charlievince.com. Your contact info. I'm going to say it again, it's so important. If you have the most incredible portfolio in the world that you spent years developing and no one can get hold of you to give you money to do that work, what are you doing? And a very brief about section. And then there's some things you don't want in your portfolio. Don't have low res images, nothing pixelated. Try to avoid putting too many works in progress or studies in there. I know it differs from industry to industry, but I know for my industry, they don't want to see your sketchbook. They don't want to see studies that you did on holiday. Okay? They want to see final, finished, polished pieces. Broken links, get your friends to test your website, get your family to test your website, get randos on the internet to test your website. It has to work easily and everything needs to be working perfectly, no broken stuff. Don't use a Tumblr or a DeviantArt, please. Please don't do that. Art directors hate to have a link to Tumblr or DeviantArt sent to them. They won't even click on it, okay? You need your own URL, not a Tumblr or a DeviantArt. And non-responsive designs, which in case you don't know what that means, a responsive design means when you look at it on your laptop and your phone, it changes depending on what you're looking at or what you're looking at it on, okay? It needs to change. And most things like Squarespace do that automatically. All their templates are responsive, but just bear that little term in mind. It has to be responsive. Some other really good websites that you can use online resources. Pinterest, perfect for hoarding inspiration and ideas and having the boards to work out reference or color palettes. Very important to be present on LinkedIn as well. It's not as pretty, it's not as exciting as the social media ones, but it's really important to be here because if an art director wants to look you up, they may well look on here. And especially if you're in the games industry or um, concept art or storyboarding, being present on ArtStation, very, very important, right? So they may well search for you on here as well as LinkedIn. So be present on this as well. And lastly, if you're an aspiring or an established illustrator, I think everyone should be a member of the Association of Illustrators. Legal advice, portfolio advice, portfolio consultations, competitions, discounts, the list goes on and on and on. It's so good. Okay, so you should consider joining the Association of Illustrators. And there's also the super duper fun idea of networking. So when I was at university and someone said to me, it's time to start learning how to network, this is what I pictured, okay? Skies in suits, talking about business. Very, very exciting, okay? This was my dreaded nightmare when someone said networking to me. It's just not what it looks like, okay? This is what awesome networking looks like. So this was an AOI meetup that I organized earlier on this year. So I organized the events for the AOI here in Norwich and we did this super cool talker, speaker-based event. It was really, really exciting. These guys came to it. Some of you guys may have come to it as well. This is what a creative networking event looks like, all right? So this is a good networking event to meet other creative people. So you have drink and draws as well. The clue is in the name. You turn up, you drink, you draw. Life drawing is a good place to meet other creatives in the city. So maybe if you don't have that many art friends in Norwich or wherever you come from, all right? These sorts of things are perfect to start finding that community. AOI meetups, you should come to the next one. It's going to be a drink and draw. It'll be really, really good. 
freelancer groups. So on Meetup, there's loads of different groups to meet creative freelancers, to vent about how the freelancing industry works and share secrets and talk about clients. Online connections, so the art station, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, all that sort of thing. And exhibitions. Attending private views is a really good way to start meeting other creative people as well. So go to these creative events because that's where all us art nerds actually go, right? So that's the best place to meet us all. And then you have to do the business connections as well, okay? There isn't just the creative folks because they may not directly give you the kind of money you want to pay your rent. It's the businesses that will be doing that. So good ways to meet businesses will be trade shows. There are trade shows for every industry. So I recently went to Italy to go to Bologna. Huge kids publishing trade show. 27,000 pe 27, people attended every year. Go to trade shows, right? They're really, really good. Social media, still, it's a good way to talk to businesses. It's a good way to link with businesses. Find out who the art director is for the studios that you like. Add them on LinkedIn. Word of mouth, it sounds really cheesy and boring, but it is true. This is the best way. This is the way that I found so many clients by being good at my job. So they passed me on to other clients. And directories as well. Directories, you can buy them from the AOI. I'm sure you can get them elsewhere as well. It's just a big spreadsheet full of the email addresses of hundreds of art directors. Gold mine. But most importantly, you just got to be nice, okay? The word of mouth thing doesn't work if you're not nice. They have to enjoy having working with you, all right? So be a really nice and exciting and fun person to work with and you will start seeing work come in loads. And naturally, how many people have a business card? Okay, there's a couple of you. There needs to be more of you guys that got business cards. You need a business card. If you're going to any event, any private view, any trade show, anything like that, have a business card. Because it's like not having a contact page on your website if you don't have one of these. You may well do the best elevator pitch ever to someone and talk to them about your work and show them your work on your phone. It's all amazing and they want to hire you for this amazing project. You don't have any way to tell them who you are. You've got nothing on you, okay? Have a business card and make it look good. Right, I have these key things on there, but it's got to look good. If you're pitching yourself as a creative, you don't want some nasty Vista print template thing that's done on thin paper, okay? Make it look really smart, because that'll be a good first impression. Treat this like a mini portfolio. So, that's enough about getting seen. So you know tons of ways now to get seen, right? I've given you loads and loads of good little things that you can start doing. Now you need to be prepared for when the work starts coming in. These terms, when they were thrown at me when I was in education, scared the hell out of me. Okay, I didn't know how to write a contract. Do I need a, a lawyer for that? What is a license is for a car? Why do I need a license for artwork? And what is copyright? Do I have to pay for it? Do I have to apply for it? How does that work? No one told me any of this, right? So I had to work it out. I had to learn myself. Contracts, this is what mine looks like. It looks like a whole bunch of scary text, but it's super simple. I got mine from the AOI because they have a watertight, really good contract template that you can use. I made mine look a bit prettier though, because remember, you're an artist. Everything, even your paperwork, needs to look good. Contracts are super easy. All I do, that page on the left, I fill in a few little bits there. They don't even need to sign it because contracts don't need to be signed, which is a common misconception. If they don't uh, protest it, if they don't say they're not going to go forward with it, then it is assumed that it's agreed upon. Okay, It even says that somewhere in all this mountain of text. right? So it's an assumption. It's agreed. Licenses and copyright. A license, super easy. All it is, is where they can use your work, for how long they can use it, and for what. Okay, so the license lives in here. You can see along there, it does say license on, th on this left-hand page. The license is just that, exactly where, how long, and for what they can use it for. So, for example, my standard license is they can use it worldwide, which is the where, for five years, which is for how long, and for, for example, print and ebook publishing, which is for what? The license doesn't cover merchandise, it doesn't cover advertising. If they want that, they have to pay me more, okay? And when the five years runs out, 
they have to pay me again if they want to keep using the image. This is why you'll see second edition books, the book cover will change. That's not because they just fancy to change, that's because the license for the original illustration ran out. So licenses play a huge role in this industry and it's how you'll price your work as well. Your copyright is even easier, it's so simple. You have it until you die plus 70 years and it's automatic. You don't need to apply for it, you don't need to pay for it, you don't need to write a little C on everything. Your, your copyright is just there. The second you've finished a piece of work, photograph, drawing, music, anything, you are then copyrighted. That work is copyrighted to you until you die plus 70 years. It's why things fall into public domain. So when there's a public domain image or song or piece of footage, it means that the creator has died over 70 years ago. So now anyone can use it because the copyright has run out. Okay? Super easy. It sounds really daunting, but it's really, really simple. Pricing your work can be really tricky. I still struggle with that. Every freelancer still struggles with that. But there's certain things that you need to think about other than how long will this take me to do? Because I don't work on an hourly basis. I do not charge per hour because of how licenses work. So the usage time of the work will play a big role. If they want to use it for five years, it's going to be cheaper than if they want to use it for 20 years. Where will it be used? Again, if it's going to be just an ebook compared to an international advertising campaign, the prices will change, even if it's the exact same illustration. Who the client is, this makes a huge impact. If you're doing an illustration for your auntie compared to one for Google, the price is obviously going to change, okay? It's fine to do that, by the way. That's not a sneaky little underhand tactic in the industry. Everyone expects you to do that. You can charge differently depending on who the client is. The complexity of the work, so a simple piece of black and white line work will be different to a 10-foot oil painting, obviously. The materials involved, if you work traditionally, and you can still consider things like subscription fees to software, those are your materials. You can consider them in your pricing. And the time it will take for you to do it. That still does play a role, but not as much as people think. People think you'll charge per hour. You'll even be asked by clients, how much do you charge per hour? You can then explain to them, doesn't work like that, buddy. This is how it works. So, some figures, because it's all well and good me saying this is how to price it, but it's good to know actual prices. So these are some figures from the AOI's huge pricing survey that they get thousands of illustrators to um, answer questions about how much they charge for work. So it's a really good way to work out a ballpark figure for how much things cost. Book covers tend to be between 500 and 3,000 pounds. Again, this can go up. If you're doing a book cover for Harry Potter, that's going to go up, okay? It generally shouldn't go down though, right? So the bottom figures on these should stay as the foundation. Editorial work tends to be between 300 and 1,000, and that's slightly lower because editorial is a quicker time frame. So often editorial work will only be used for 24 hours. So it'll have a 24 hour long license, which is really quick, but think about newspapers. They only use the work for a day. Character development can be between 500 and just over two and a half grand. Again, it can change. If you're doing one bust like that one, that'll be lower than loads and loads and loads of character sheets. And this is a big one as well, logo design. Think about the license involved in a logo design. So not only will it be worldwide, but the usage time is often indefinite. And you will, this is one of the only times you will ever hand over copyright to your work, okay? If you get a contract from someone suggesting you have to hand over copyright for an illustration, they are wrong. You do not hand over your copyright unless it's a logo or branding. This is why logos can cost so much money. They can go well into the tens and hundreds of thousands. I mean, for example, that BBC logo up the top, three black and white letters in squares. Anyone have any idea how much that would cost? No? 6.2 million. Yeah? For three little letters in squares. <laughs> Your face back there. Because of the license. Think about how often you see that logo, how where it's used, how often it's being used. 
the license made that so expensive. Okay, so get into logo design. Another thing you need to bear in mind when you're doing any sort of client work, has anyone seen the design triangle before? This is something you need to have hardwired into your brain at all times. So a client can only ever have two points of this triangle. It can be good, quick, and cheap. They can never have all three. So if they want it quick and cheap, it's gonna look like garbage, okay? If they want it to be cheap and looking really good, it's gonna take you forever to do it, right? It's impossible for them to get all three. It's not fair on you. It makes the industry seem bad. You only need to deliver two points of that triangle. And if you find the client is starting to try and get all three points, you need to reevaluate your contract, okay? So very important little triangle. Also some red flags, right? So these are things I've encountered. These are things every freelancer encounters all the time. These are not clients you want to work for. They can't or won't pay you. And I've put sometimes down there because I have occasionally done work for charities or for a nonprofit that I have been passionate about and I've wanted to put that work in my portfolio. That is the only time I will work for free. They want to sub-license your work. So now we know what a license means. Sub-license means they can take that license and sell it to other people without your permission. I've been given contracts before where that's in there and I have immediately crossed that out and sent it back to them and said, I will only sign it if this is no longer in there. Do not let them sub-license your work. They won't sign a contract. That's a big red flag. If they won't sign it, that's super dodgy. Do not work with them. They demand work before payment. I will always ask for at least 30% of the final fee before I even pick up my pencil, okay? I have to have that secured before I start doing any work. And they won't allow you to maintain copyright. So remember what I said about only ever handing over copyright when it's a logo or when it's branding. If they're trying to get that from you or if they ask you to waive moral rights, that means they're trying to take all the rights to that image and they are not allowed to do that. So that's being prepared. You are now prepared for what happens when a client comes along. What does a client then expect you to do once this contract is done, invoice is sent, everyone's happy to proceed? This is how my timeline works. So I will get a brief. The paperwork starts. That's the first thing, like I said, before I pick up a pencil or a graphics tablet or anything, I send them an invoice for 50% normally and a contract. Once that's cleared and that's in my bank account and it's everyone's happy, then I will start with my thumbnails which are really, really small, quick illustrations, just to see composition, character design, that kind of thing. I'll send them a bunch of thumbnails. They'll let me know which one they like. There'll inevitably be billions of amendments because there always is. Final piece will be produced. Everyone's happy. I'll invoice them for the final 50%. When that's in my bank account, I'll send them the final images, okay? you need to protect your back as well as theirs. So make sure that you're not delivering work before it's paid for, you're not starting work before the contract's agreed upon, keep yourself safe. And obviously, research and reference your work throughout the whole thing, not just at the beginning. I wish it looked like this. <laughs> I wish I got a brief, I produced this incredible final piece and I submitted it and everyone was happy. It looks an awful lot more like this. This is my process. It's not a pretty process. It's a real frustrating one, but it's how nearly all of these processes work. And it's fine. It's fine for the client to change the color of something. It's fine for them to not want an illustration. You will have cancellation fees in your contract. Don't panic. It's fine for the computer to bust up and you have to do something else, all right? This stuff happens. It doesn't just happen to you. It doesn't just happen to me. It happens to all of us. I wish it was this, but it's this, okay? And you've got to keep those clients real happy, okay? Like I said about being nice, about word of mouth, about how important it is to create a good name for yourself in this industry, especially publishing, games design, everyone knows everyone. And if you immediately project yourself as an annoying person to work with, no one's gonna hire you, okay? So do not leave in spelling errors with your correspondence with clients, okay? My name gets spelt wrong constantly. 
I don't have an E on the end of my Charlie. It's in my email address, it's in, my it's in the subject, it's in my signature, it's in everything, and yet clients will put an E on the end of my name constantly, right? They're lucky they're my client, it's not the other way around. Don't spell their name wrong, don't spell the job wrong, don't spell the company wrong, check the spelling. Don't forget your paperwork, remember, get the invoice sent, get the contract sent, don't be lax with it. Even if it's a family member, even if it's a friend, send them a contract, okay? Get into the habit of it. Don't go silent. If you're worried about your work, if you think you're gonna be late, if you're getting stressed out about it, keep in touch with them. Don't just disappear off the face of the earth. And don't be self-deprecating, guys. The amount of portfolio reviews I've done and interviews that I've done, all sorts of things. The first thing a student will say to me is, oh, I'm not this, oh, I'm not very good at that. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, don't look at that bit. Don't start with a negative, because in their brain, all they're gonna think is, oh, wow, they're not very confident in their own work, okay? Be positive and active and confident in your work. Do not start projecting yourself as scared of your own work, okay? So do not self-deprecate yourself. You're all awesome, it's fine. Do do these things. Do keep in touch. If you think you're going to be late, don't panic. Tell them. Okay? I had to do this last year. I had four million bits of client work pile up and I needed an extra week to deliver some finals. I emailed them with plenty of time in advance and I said, I'm afraid I'm going to need an extra week. Some other stuff has come up. Is that okay? And they said, yeah, it's fine. If I had then just not delivered at all, if I had not told them I'm going to be late and not delivered the work, then it's a problem. Keep in touch with the client. Stay professional, okay? Remember, even if they're really buddy-buddy, even if they put emojis all over the place, even if they sign off their emails with four million Xs, okay? That's fine for them to do. You should stay professional, right? They're your client. They're not your buddy. Inform and help them especially if they're a private client, if they're not some big publishing house or some big studio, maybe if they're not aware of how licenses work and contracts work, tell them, inform them. There's pages on the AOI specifically designed to be sent to clients that don't understand certain things. Get those pages, send them over to those guys and deliver on time. Even if, like I said, it can be a bit late and you panic and you have to tell them, deliver on time for your next deadline. If you give yourself an extra week, you have to deliver after that week, okay? That's really, really important. So, I'm gonna wrap up as well, because I don't wanna overrun too much. Uh, push your work out into the world. Like I said, no one's gonna hire you if they don't know that you even exist. You have to get your work out there. Let people know that you're an active and present artist, that you're still working. Avoid those key mistakes, so don't, sign off for work before you've sent a contract. Don't send off the final illustrations before you've sent an invoice, okay? Avoid those bad clients that are trying to get stuff from you that you shouldn't give them, like your copyright. Keep producing your work, even if you don't have any uni work, college work, school work, client work, whatever, even if you don't have any of that coming in at the moment, do personal work, do self-initiated work because that's what they want to see in portfolios. Sometimes they really want to see self-initiated stuff. When I had portfolio reviews for the book fair in Bologna, they all said, we want to see more self-initiated work because they really, really like seeing that because it shows that you're doing it for a passion, not just to get some money. And research your industry, okay? Be aware of what they're looking for. Be aware of what each individual studio is looking for. If you're sending a submission, for the love of God, read the submissions page, okay? If they only accept a PDF, don't then send them 50 PNGs, right? Be aware of what they're looking for. And very, very importantly, you've got to look after yourselves, guys. Us artists are real bad at that, okay? We stress, we get ill, we get all poor and tired, right? Look after yourself. So, take care of your brain. Mental health is very important in this industry because rejections can be extra hard for artists because it's not black and white it's a part of us that we've just presented to them and if they don't want it it can be extra hard to take so take care of your brain stretch and hydrate okay i know this is starting to sound like a yoga class but i promise this is really really important we're hunched over desks all day staring at computers all day 
get up every now and then and stretch and have a drink. Otherwise, you're just going to burn out. And burnout lasts a hell of a lot longer than taking a break. Okay, a burnout can last weeks. A 45 minute break can avoid that burnout. Okay, don't push yourselves too hard. Find art friends because we're all weird and you need weird people in your life. Okay, go to these sorts of events that I said earlier, the private views, the drink and draws, the AOI events. You should all come to my events because they're really cool. Find art friends because it helped me so, so much finding a cluster of creative, really cool artistic people because we all get it and enjoy the journey. No matter what stage you're at now, don't panic that you're not some huge concept artist or some highly in demand illustrator. Okay, enjoy where you are now and keep pushing yourself and don't panic about immediately moving on to the next step. So these resources, I suggest you all take a quick picture of this screen because these are all amazing resources and I wish someone had shown me this list when I was in your position. It would have helped me so much. Amazing books, amazing inspiration, some really helpful advice in there as well. These are all brilliant and you should all have a quick look at those. And this is where you can find me as well. So thank you ever so much for you guys coming. I'm really sorry if I threw so much at you because it's all so important, okay? All that stuff that I told you, I wish I'd had this talk delivered to me when I was at uni or college because it would have really helped answer some of my questions. So we have a few minutes before the next speaker barges in and takes over my space. So does anyone have any questions about anything, illustration, freelancing, creativity, anything like that? Yeah. What's the difference between a book cover and an editorial? So book cover is literally the cover of a book. So that'll just be either ebook, print, anything like that. An editorial will be a spot illustration or a magazine cover, but the license is a lot shorter on an editorial. So they'll use it for a week, 24 hours, months, depending on how often that magazine or newspaper goes out. So newspaper, magazines, publishing. Yeah. Would you set out an animation portfolio similar to? An very similar, very, very similar. I've, uh, I've made a demo reel, would that be any use to? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what they want to see. Because especially if you're pitching your stuff to agencies or studios in particular, they will yeah. always ask for a demo reel. And just make sure your website is super easy to browse because obviously images easier to pitch to people. Animation, you need to make sure your video file is easy to load, make sure it's quick to load, make sure no one's sitting there for four hours for it to buffer, make sure there's no autoplay sound as well, because sometimes that can be really annoying if they're flicking through it and then they suddenly get deafened by whatever's on your website. Okay, so like I said, get people to test it for you, send it off to people and get really honest feedback. But yeah, the animation portfolio is very, very similar to illustration. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'm, uh, I'm currently an international student, so do you have any advice for finding like international clients? It works pretty much the same way. I mean, because creatives tend to work remotely anyway, I never really meet my clients. I'll never go to their offices. There's never any issues with that. I've worked with clients in the US, in Australia, all over the place, and it works exactly the same. So directories, like I said, that list, that Excel spreadsheet of all the email addresses, they're from all over the world. So the directories tend to cover everywhere. The artist and writer's handbook as well that comes out every single year covers agents and art directors all over the world as well. So there's not a huge difference to trying to get work internationally than there is trying to get work nationally. So no problem. Any more questions? Yeah? Uh, when you go to physical networking events, mm. do you take any kind of physical portfolio or do you just use that time to get to know people and then give them a card? That's a super good question. It's important to have the ability or to have that there if you need it. So a really good thing to have, I know there's a super financial barrier to this, but an iPad or a tablet is very, very good to have on you. If you don't have the resources to have that with you, when I went to Bologna, I did these, I got concertina portfolios printed, which is just this long strip. You open it up, tiny little A5 images of my work, wrapped up, bound up, looking all pretty. And you can leave those with people. So get some of those printed if you're going to a really, really big event, but you should have the ability to show them your work if you can. Even if it's just on your phone, have your website queued up, ready to go. 
So yeah, that is good to do if you need to. Yeah. Um, okay. When you were talking about cards, mm -hmm. where did uh, you get your cards? Because uh, I'm just like trying to get ideas of where I could get them. Separate. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, a uh, solo press I use. They're really, really good. Really quick delivery. The print quality is lovely. The card stock they use is lush. I've got loads of my cards with me, actually. You guys are more than welcome to take one. Um, they spot UV. They can do matte finish, all sorts of stuff. But Solo Press, I found really, really good. I'll say, pretty much any good printer, just do not do Vista Print, for the love of God. Please don't get stuff printed with Vista Print because it's weird. If you look at them, they skip every other pixel when they're printing to save money on ink and if you look closely the print quality is shocking all right okay any other questions you guys got yeah oh sorry yeah no problem yeah these are all excellent i super suggest everyone have a look at every single one of these these books as well illustrator's guide to law and business the chapter on copyright is chunky but so important to read through there's so, so much complicated stuff behind copyright, but you should really be aware of how copyright works. This is the rights to your work. You need to know your rights when it comes to that kind of thing. Does anyone have any more questions? They can be, if you, even if you think they're really stupid. Yeah? So, uh, if the current store wants changes to the work, mm -hmm. how many changes do you allow, and what if the current store wants changes after you allow a certain amount? That depends on the individual. I mean, a lot of places, the standard contract will often allow uh, two, if it's a big job, two minor changes, or you can up that number if you need to. Sometimes I'll keep it open, so I'll just do a reasonable amount of changes, but if they start going above that, you can then charge them. And you'll have the amount that you'll charge them in your copyright, it'll say, allow for two minor changes, uh, any additional changes will cost blah blah amount and then you can invoice them for that amount and once that amount has arrived you can then do those changes but it'll also have in your copyright uh, or in your contract if those changes mean that you no longer meet the deadline you're not liable for any damages that happen if that deadline isn't met so if they ask you for four million changes to a 200 page graphic novel that needs delivering tomorrow it's not your fault if it's not delivered tomorrow Thank you. that's all right any other questions you guys got? Hey. <laughs> Drink and Draw is going to be in June. Yes, that one. June, either the 20th or the 27th. We haven't got it all secured yet, but if you guys are on Instagram, which you should be, remember, if you go on Norwich underscore AOI, this is where I post all the information about the events we've got coming up. So you should definitely come. It's going to be awesome. You guys got any more? Yeah. Do you charge for your researching process? What? Uh, no, 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 not generally, no. But um, again, I don't work on time frame, so I don't charge per hour. So I will include that research time in just my process because I should have put a little graph off of what the illustration process looks like, a pie chart, because the tiniest sliver is actually creating illustrations. Okay? The rest of it is a huge chunk for research, a huge chunk for admin, Accounts, because remember, you have to, if you don't have an accountant, you've got to be your own accountant when you're freelance. Uh, the finance part of it, the marketing part of it, there's this tiny sliver that's actually doing drawing. Okay, so you do just count the research and reference with your process. You. That's all right. Yeah. Um, you come across as extremely confident. Um, Thanks. Work, and that's something that I kind of struggle with personally, so I kind of question as to whether I'm in the right industry or not. Um, I I kind of want to know how do I look at a piece of work and feel really confident and like I want to look at it and, and think yeah I love it I'm super proud of it like I struggle with that sometimes sometimes it's it's I, st I really do struggle with that honestly imposter syndrome is a thing we all deal with it it's really really hard sometimes on a very rare occasion it can do you good to do the whole fake it till you make it yeah. if you present yourself as an illustrator who's confident and established and able to deliver the work, people will view you as an illustrator that's confident and able to deliver the work, even if you're sitting with your sketchbook crying, trying to make this piece of work. On your website, you look amazing. So just present yourself as someone who, you'd, who you admire. So have a look at how other illustrators present themselves. 
how they speak, how they act, the work that they put out there. I'm not saying copy their work, yeah. but try to present yourself in a similar sort of way. So fake it till you make it a little bit, but also be careful because social media creates this false sense of reality that we get where, because we're really bad for this, we'll only post our good work, but behind every bit of good work there's a hundred terrible drawings that I've shoved in a bin somewhere, okay? So don't think that you're the only one out there who's maybe making bad ideas or having a sketchbook that you don't really like or struggling to get work because every single one of us is dealing with that as well. But social media and the internet and everything will tell you otherwise, ignore it. It's talking nonsense. So just be confident in the fact that you're in the same boat as all of us art weirdos. <laughs> yeah. Have you got any uh, advice on increasing your visibility on, say, Instagram? Use the right hashtags. Yeah. So put the right hashtags in there. Follow the right people. Don't blanket follow people. Don't follow like 50 people in an hour because that will show up as in the algorithm. It'll start censoring what you're showing. So you have to work with their horrific algorithms. Yeah, um, yeah right hashtags. Uh, sometimes this is when fan art becomes useful because the hashtags for fan art, if you put Avengers in there or something like that, you're gonna get more people seeing your stuff. And even if it's just one bit of fan art that brings people to a portfolio full of original work, you're gonna get more traffic. Okay, so that's when that can be useful. Uh, if you do prints or if you have merchandise, doing a giveaway is always good, where it's the whole like and comment to enter. <laughs> that can be really, really good to bring people in. So I did one of those recently on Twitter, brought me in a load more followers. Cost me whatever it costs to do that small print. Okay, so th there's loads of different ways you can start bringing people in, but just be consistent with your posting as well. So try to post at least once every two or three days. Cool. Oh, stories. Sorry. Yes, sorry, last thing. Stories, very, very good. They bring in tons of people. People love browsing stories. Try and keep a story updated as often as you can. Hey. Yeah, all the time. So social media, the stories on Instagram, that's a really good place to post things like sketchbooks and works in progress. And uh, the stories on Instagram are a good way to humanize you as well. So sometimes I'll put a picture of my dog on there, which is not relevant. I wouldn't put that in my portfolio, but it humanizes me. People then see me as a person that has a personality that they can hire and that will be nice to work with because you don't want to be viewed as an art factory. So, yeah, I do definitely post stuff on social media that I won't put on my portfolio. Yeah? Following on from that, yeah. how does it work kind of legally and morally if you're doing a client piece of work, mm -hmm. sort of putting a work in progress for something that maybe the client... That's a tricky one. You Depends if they have an NDA in place, non-disclosure agreement. If they don't want you to post anything, you are not allowed to post anything. So I've did, I did two published works last year. I wasn't allowed to post anything about the fact that I was doing work for published works for that publisher. I could maybe do it as like a little, tiny little photograph of a face or something with the comment of like, oh, drawing some really fun stuff at the moment. Because that does nothing. That won't tell anyone anything unless it's Harry Potter's face. Then maybe that's a clue. But yeah, you've got to be really, really careful with that. If you're worried, just ask the client. Just, I've had to ask them before, I've said, would you be comfortable with me posting some works in progress on Instagram? And they can say yes or no. And it's fine, you just have to do what they say. They're the client after all. <laughs>